When you really love a rock band, you want to dig deep and learn everything there is to know about them. Good times, the bad times, the really, really weird times. Well, here are some truly strange stories about some truly iconic bands. Hit it! Van Halen are in a class all their own. Trained pianist and self-taught guitarist Eddie Van Halen reinvented the electric guitar, making the instrument mimic animal sounds and wailing away so fast you'd swear he was playing a stringed machine gun. Meanwhile, on-again, off-again vocalist David Lee Roth was the ultimate showman. Goofy, gaudy, and gleefully ridiculous. And what's more ridiculous than a rock band that demands concert promoters provide bowls of M&Ms backstage, but absolutely no brown ones. That was a serious request, too. As David Lee Roth tells it, the concert writer explained exactly what would happen if band members found brown M&Ms backstage. The promoter would forfeit the entire show at full pay. It sounds like a case of celebrity egos gone wild, but as Roth explained, the outlandish request was actually a precautionary measure. Van Halen concerts involved sophisticated lighting and stage directions, and if they weren't followed to the letter, it could lead to unsafe working conditions. Finding brown M&Ms was a telltale sign that promoters hadn't bothered reading the technical specifications in the concert writer. Pretty clever, eh? When it comes to post-grunge, it doesn't get much grungier than Puddle of Mud. Not only is the band named after wet dirt, but frontman Wes Scantlin is often compared to grunge icon Kurt Cobain. Unfavorably compared, that is. Critics have bristled at Scantlin's stage persona. For example, Variety called him out for mimicking Kurt Cobain during a live concert, and even said his performance was annoying. As time went on, Scantlin became less of a Kurt Cobain clone, but started behaving more and more erratically. Wes Scantlin is being held on disorderly conduct charges. He was arrested for an incident at Mitchell International Airport. Earlier this year, he was arrested at Denver's airport for riding on a luggage carousel. One of the most glaring examples of Scantlin's unhinged behavior? According to NME, he attacked a neighbor's patio with a buzzsaw. That neighbor happened to be electropop musician Sasha Gradiva, who claimed Scantlin's behavior stemmed from a long-running feud. Gradiva says Scantlin envied the view from her patio and lashed out in creative ways, like blocking her lovely view with flags and a tent. In 2016, Scantlin reportedly rigged his car to look like an improvised bomb, and his outrageous behavior affected multiple neighbors. He was allegedly trying to scare away would-be thieves, but his stunt ended up attracting the bomb squad, and they immediately ordered nearby residents to evacuate. Led by the legendary Iggy Pop, the Stooges were pioneers of punk in the 1960s and 70s. And all these years later, Pop hasn't exactly mellowed with age. Okay, you're so so can't you see I'm in pain? I don't care about the money. Where's my integrity? Although Iggy Pop occasionally wore dog collars and sang the 1969 classic I Wanna Be Your Dog, you should never ask him to dog sit for you. In 1973, he reportedly fed Valium to his girlfriend's dogs, Puppet and Furburger. According to The Guardian, Pop's girlfriend found him lying in a bathtub with her two pets, which prompted the rock star to calmly reassure her, I'm a dog lover. I know a lot about animals. Thankfully, the canines recovered, but only after getting turned away from St. Vincent's Hospital. Oh, and here's another furry anecdote involving Iggy and the Stooges. In 1973, Elton John reportedly pranked the band by storming the stage in a gorilla costume. Pop was reportedly under the influence of something or another, and he couldn't tell whether he was hallucinating or seeing a real gorilla. He later said of the incident, I was like, oh my god, what can I do? I couldn't fight him. I could barely stand. Guitarist James Williamson was also unprepared for the hairy surprise and said that Elton John came very close to getting a guitar smashed against him. Fortunately, Elton John revealed his true identity before things got violent. The name Holland Oats sounds like part of a complete breakfast. In fact, Early Bird Foods and Company even named a breakfast cereal Holland Oats, prompting the musicians to sue in 2015. Of course, prior to that trademark battle, Daryl Hall and John Oates produced tons of rock classics. Since releasing their debut album, 1972's Whole Oats, which also sounds like a breakfast cereal, they've written more hits than you can shake an oversized drumstick at. There's the infectious head bopper You Make My Dreams and the moody melodramatic man-eater to name just a few. But when Hall and Oates first met in 1967, they were busy getting away from knife-wielding high schoolers. As Hall told The Independent in 1998, I was about 17 or 18 years old and I had a doo-wop street corner group called The Temp Tones. Meanwhile, Oates belonged to an R&B band called The Masters. Both groups were slated to perform at a Philadelphia venue, but then things got a little crazy. As Hall remembers it, we're just ready to go on, and, I, and, we, and we're looking outside, and I hear this bang, bang, and there's guns going off. 
Hall explained to The Independent, a fight broke out between rival high school fraternities, which really were just gangs with Greek letters. As the frats started attacking each other with chains and knives, Hall and Oates both hurried for the exit, and that's how they wound up meeting. The rest, as they say, is rock and roll history. Enigmatic Doors frontman Jim Morrison would no doubt be remembered as a legend no matter how he died. But the suspicious circumstances surrounding his death add an extra layer of mystery. Morrison's lifeless body was discovered in a bathtub on July 3, 1971, but his untimely demise went unconfirmed for nearly a week and an autopsy was never conducted. There were loads of conspiracy theories at the time. Did Morrison fake his death? Was the CIA covering it up? As founding member John Dinsmore told Huffington Post in 2013, No one I've ever met would be more capable of faking their death than him. There's another eerie component to the singer's death, specifically in regards to L.A. Woman, the last Doors album Morrison recorded. In a weird bit of foreshadowing, Morrison recorded the vocals for L.A. Woman in a bathroom. According to Rolling Stone, the Doors decided not to record the album in a high-end studio, opting instead to create the record in the cluttered Santa Monica Boulevard workshop where they often rehearsed. Morrison reportedly tore the door off the bathroom and recorded the vocals in there. The last vocals he ever recorded for The Doors can be heard in the song Riders on the Storm. That song entered the Billboard charts on the exact same day Morrison died. A creative mind can find artistic inspiration in even the most heartbreaking circumstances. Known for whipping it good and wearing energy dome hats, Devo formed in response to the Kent State shooting. According to history, the shooting lasted a mere 13 seconds. For several days in 1970, students at Kent State University protested then-President Richard Nixon ordering the invasion of Cambodia. On May 4, 1970, Ohio National Guardsmen opened fire and killed four students. Among them were Allison Krauss and Jeffrey Miller, both of whom were friends with Devo co-founder Gerald Casali. As Casali told Vice, I saw the blood running out of Jeffrey Miller and Allison Krauss from their exit wounds in the noonday sun. On top of dealing with the trauma and loss, Casali was also profoundly affected by news coverage of the event. The stories were lies, the uh, way the media portrayed it, of course, gave me an early lesson in distortion and how uh, what you see isn't what you get. According to Vice, Casali was an art student who already had a bleak worldview at the time. In fact, he'd already been using the term devolution and its abbreviated form Devo to describe what he saw as a decline in American values. However, the Kent State shooting created a sense of urgency that ultimately inspired the formation of Devo, a rock band that used Dadaist humor to sharply criticize modern society. Dave Matthews' band has given the world plenty of hits, including Crash Into Me and the Grammy Award-winning So Much To Say, which shouldn't be confused with that other hit, What Would You Say? As for the secret of his success, Matthews told CBS This Morning in 2019, I've been incredibly lucky. Well, some of his luck ran out in the summer of 2004. According to NBC Universal, the musician was traveling by plane when he first learned that a tour bus had dumped 800 pounds of human waste into the Chicago River. What's worse, a lot of that waste reportedly landed on a tour boat carrying over 100 sightseers and splashed horrified passengers. For his part, Matthew said he initially laughed at the news, totally unaware that the bus belonged to his band. So how did this happen? According to court records, the bus driver stopped at a bridge and unloaded the liquid ickiness while on his way to pick up a band member. In 2009, Matthews opened up about Poopgate, telling the Kara's Basement podcast, I regret that enormously, and I know some people in, uh, there accept uh, my apology. As part of an out-of-court settlement, the Dave Matthews Band reportedly paid $100,000 to Chicago-based organizations and agreed to pay $200,000 to an environmental fund. As frontman of the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Jimi Hendrix set the world and his guitar on fire. His breathtaking rendition of the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock is inarguably one of the defining moments of the 60s. But here's a little known fact. Shortly after that concert, Hendrix was reportedly abducted and went missing for about two days. Inexplicably, nobody called the police. According to Rolling Stone, people close to Hendrix claimed that Hendrix was abducted by mafia gunmen and held in upstate New York in a dispute involving a recording deal. Infamous cocaine trafficker John Roberts was accused of assisting in the kidnapping, but he insists he helped rescue Hendrix from two, quote, wise guy wannabes. Supposedly, these wannabes abducted Hendrix after spotting him at a mafia-run club while he was trying to score drugs. They demanded an unspecified ransom from Hendrix's manager but released the musician after being threatened by some genuine gangsters. 
Some people believe Hendrix's manager, Michael Jeffrey, staged the abduction. Musician Buddy Miles, who performed in Hendrix's trio, Band of Gypsies, accused Jeffrey of drugging Hendrix with LSD in a scheme to ruin the group. Why? According to the book The Essential Jimi Hendrix, Miles believed Jeffrey wanted to bring about the return of the experience lineup. We may never know what really happened here. Formed in Melbourne in 1979, Men at Work landed their first record deal in 1981 and quickly became hugely popular, even nabbing a Best New Artist Grammy in 1983. That same year, the New York Times wrote, This year's music business success story has been Men at Work, who came out of nowhere, also known as Australia. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, their 1981 hit, Down Under, also became, quote, an unofficial Australian anthem. It's an impressive rock and roll resume for sure. But in 2007, a joke question on the music quiz show Spicks and Specs spelled serious trouble for Men at Work. Contestants were asked what Australian children's song featured prominently in Down Under. Kookaburra sitting in the old gum tree. That's exactly the one. Apparently, the catchy flute section in Down Under lifts portions of the 1934 song Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. To be clear, the Kookaburra song only has four bars and Down Under contains two of them. After the episode of Spicks and Specs aired, the company that owns the rights to the children's song sued for royalties and won. Many people were displeased with the outcome. Copyright law lasts for life plus 70 years, um, and I think that is an excessive period of time. Here's Trevor Conomy, author of Down Under, a book that delved deeply into the bizarre lawsuit. Most people seem to consider that the outcome was wrong. And I, I share your view, uh, Trevor. I think it's absolutely outrageous. That Following the lawsuit, things took a heartbreaking turn for Minute Works' Greg Ham. He reportedly had to sell his home and allegedly began drinking and taking heroin. He passed away in 2012. After the ruling, Ham said he was terribly disappointed that that's the way I'm going to be remembered for copying something. Pink Floyd's otherworldly albums explored the dark side of the moon and the dark side of mankind. And their 1977 album Animals painted humanity in a particularly negative light. Described by Guitar World as a bitter masterpiece, the album skewered British society in sprawling songs that were seemingly about pigs, dogs, and sheep but were actually about politicians, businessmen, and the complacent masses. It's an iconic album, and it's also the reason a large inflatable pig wound up drifting through the London sky, causing a whole bunch of drama. For the album cover, bassist and singer-songwriter Roger Waters wanted to photograph an inflatable pig hovering between the smokestacks of London's Battersea Power Station, but all hell broke loose when it was finally time to photograph the 40-foot-long monstrosity. As graphic designer Aubrey Powell told the website Sew Your Soul, the chain broke and the pig sailed up 20,000 feet, ending up right in the center of Heathrow air traffic. According to Powell, airport flights were grounded while the Royal Air Force searched high and low for the missing inflatable creature. According to Guitar World, a pilot reported seeing a flying pig and was subsequently forced to take a breathalyzer test. Fittingly, the pig eventually landed in the fields of a farm where its brief taste of freedom ended. That'll do, pig. That'll do. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite bands are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.